afternoon. I have two topics for you. Um, the first one is programming style, which is sometimes thought of as the part of your program that the compiler ignores. Sometimes thought that uh, since the compiler doesn't pay any attention to it, there's no reason for us to pay attention to it either, that one style is as good as another. I'm going to try to persuade you that's not true, that some styles are significantly more beneficial than others. And the other topic is your brain. Um, now, these topics would appear to have absolutely nothing in common with each other. What could brains have to do with programming? It turns out there's a connection, and a really surprising connection. So um, I'm going to be misrepresenting the work of Daniel Kahneman, the Nobel-winning psychologist. Now, it turns out Nobel doesn't award a prize for psychology, so they gave him the award for economics. He's not an economist. But he found that, um, that some of the first principles of economics aren't true, uh, such as um, in, in any transaction, a party can be expected to pursue their own best interest. This turns out not to be strictly true if any of those parties is a human being. Because it turns out that people do not think the way economists think we think. In fact, we don't think the way most of us think we think. The way we think is really quite different and surprising. And, and that is why Kahneman got the prize. Um, so he came up with a model of two systems. Um, it's not a, a physical model. It's just a descriptive model. System two is the analytical engine. It's the thing that we think with. It's the thing that we think we are when we think about ourselves. It um, is able to do mathematics and arithmetic and logic. It's where we do our high-level reasoning. It's also very slow. And it's because it's so slow that we had to invent computers, because system two just can't generate the numbers as fast as we need them. Um, and also, it requires a lot of effort to run system two, so we tend to turn it off as much as possible. Then there's system one. System one is heuristic, it's associative, it is very, very fast, and you cannot turn it off. One of the characteristics of system one is that if it is given a problem that is too difficult for it to solve, it will substitute a simpler problem and solve that instead. Now, um, the fact that there are these two systems is not surprising. Uh, we've always been aware of that. You know, my head tells me one thing, but my gut tells me something else. Head and gut very easily map onto system two and system one. The thing which is surprising is that system one provides the working assumptions for system two, and system two is completely unaware of that. Um, and because system two, or system one is associative and approximate and has no understanding of mathematics, it frequently gets things wrong. Um, but system two is trying to do logic with these false assumptions. And as you know, if you have a logical system with false inputs, you can get false outputs. And it turns out we do this all the time. The more you read Kahneman, the more amazing it is that we ever get anything done, because we are really fallible creatures. So I'm going to give you an example of, of how these two systems work from visual processing. Visual processing is the opposite of computer graphics. It's where you take a signal from a camera, extract the pixels, and analyze the pixels in order to figure out what all the objects are in the scene and how they are all moving relative to each other and the camera. It turns out just to walk around in the world, it's really important to be able to solve these problems. And it's really hard. Computers have a very difficult time doing this. But we're able to do it all the time. And there's obvious evolutionary value in order in it being able to do that. You know, when you're being chased through the jungle by a saber cat, you need to solve the problem of how you get through the thing and also do the latency compensation because it takes time for this hunk of meat to, to work out the calculations but you need to anticipate where you're about to be in order to keep your feet moving. We do that without even thinking about it, which is really quite remarkable. But in order to do that, we will substitute the solutions to simpler problems rather than hard problems, which sometimes give us incorrect results. And we can observe that in optical illusions. This is an illusion developed by um, Edward Adelson of MIT. And here we have a, a a checkered board with white squares and black squares and a cylinder on it. 
and two of the squares are labeled A and B. It turns out A and B are exactly the same color. If you're to load this into Photoshop and, and test the pixels, they are exactly the same pixel value. And that may be a surprise to most of you. So to, to prove that in fact they are the same, I'll take a solid colored square and connect them. And you can see there's no break, it's com completely continuous. They are the same color. Now some of you may be seeing a gradient there connecting them. It, there's no gradient, it's solid color. Um, and you can prove that by covering up square B with your hand um, and the gradient disappears. And then if you drop it, the gradient reappears. Now, you know the truth of this picture. Your brain is lying to you. There's this component in our, in our heads which, when presented with inconsistency, will generate consistency. And that's probably a good thing because computers, when they become inconsistent, are likely to fall over. Um, but when you're running through the jungle, you don't want to be falling over because you get some inconsistent data. So instead, we've got systems which are working continuously to try to make consistent what is inconsistent. And sometimes that tells us that things are true which are not true. Now, it turns out all of this stuff was not news to the advertising industry. They've been depending on this stuff for a long, long time that they could convince us that we needed things that we do not need by creating messages and target, targeting them directly to the gut, to, to system one. Um, and system one will receive those messages. System two can be oblivious to them. Um, but once system one determines that there's a need, system two is hopeless to resist. And nobody understood this better than the tobacco industry. Because you look at tobacco. How do you sell tobacco? What does it do? It makes you smell bad, it turns your teeth yellow, it makes you sick and then it kills you. So how do you convince people, yeah, I want to do that? Um, you give them images which are confusing. And, um, you know, for example, um, the gut is very much attuned to immediate danger. You know, uh, fight or flight is associated with that. Um, but slow death is confused with good for you. And so, um, you know, it, it, it's, we're not reliable. So that is the brain that we're using to write computer programs. Um, and there's nothing in our evolutionary background to suggest we should be able to do this. And somehow we're able to do it anyway. And it's really hard because programs are the most complicated things that humans make. Um, they're made up of a large number of pieces, a lot of operators and variables and, and structures, and they all have to work together, and we don't have anything else that contains as many component parts as programs. So very early on it was recognized programming is way too difficult. We need to get the machine to be writing the programs for us, because in many ways it's smarter than we are. Um, so one of the first goals of artificial intelligence was to be able to give a specification of a program to a machine and let the machine write the program. And that completely failed. Artificial intelligence has been able to do a lot of amazing things. Um, it plays really good chess now. Uh, you can play a pretty good game of Jeopardy. But you can't give a set of requirements and, and a stack of, of customer interviews to a program and ask it to write a, a, another program. Um, if you could, then what we could do is ask the program, OK, now write a program that's better than you. And we keep doing that until they take over. Um, but that hasn't happened. And it hasn't happened because uh, we don't really know how we do programming, at least not well enough that we can tell a computer how to do it. What computers can do is translate one formal language into another. That's something that is algorithmic and they can do it very effectively. And so we leverage that in programming languages because that's what a programming language is. It's a mapping of one language to another. And every generation or so, we raise the level of abstraction up to where things are easier, um, which gives us more uh, leverage, the ability to write more and more complex stuff. Um, the, the hardest thing about programming is that it requires perfection. A program has to be perfect in every aspect for all possible inputs in all possible states. And that's hard, um, because the contract we have with the computer is, if the program is not perfect, then the computer has license to do the worst possible thing 
at the worst possible time. And it's not even the computer's fault. Whose fault is it? Your fault. You're the guys who get the call. Why is the thing not working? Um, but it's not surprising that it's not working because, um, you know, given that that's the case, we would want to never release a piece of software until we were convinced it was perfect. But we don't do that for a number of reasons. One is we wouldn't know perfect if we saw it. We, we have no way of determining if a piece of software is perfect. There's no test, no way to know. Um, so we wouldn't know it if we saw it. But even if we could, it'd probably take too long, and we could not afford the time it would take to reach perfection before we got some utility out of it. So instead, we release the software in a form which we know is imperfect and hope that any imperfections can be found before anybody notices. We call that beta. And, and that's the state of the art. That's the best we figured out how to do, which is crazy, but that's where we are. Um, and we are there because we are hunters and gatherers. There's been no human evolution since the Ice Age. Um, and there's nothing in our evolution to have prepared us for this. So it's sort of a miracle that we're able to do this at all. Um, so evolution likes dual use technologies. It develops something for some purpose and then finds another use for it. And I think that happened uh, for programming as well. So obviously we're using the head. We're using system two because so much of what we do is analytical. We're keeping all the state in our heads and manipulating it until we can get it down into a representation that can execute. But I think the gut also has a role in this because we cannot describe how we do programming. You can't write down a, a list of steps and give it to someone and say, that's how you write a program. You know, you kind of go top down for a while and then you kind of bottom up and you're inside out. And, Macro view, micro view, you're constantly shifting around, looking at the problem from all aspects until finally sort of the program starts to come into shape. And we don't know how we do that. There's no way we can describe that. And that's somehow we all figure it out, um, but we don't know how we figured it out. And that's why we can't teach computers to do this. And I think that there is some, some role for the gut in doing that, that somehow, um, it does this counterintuitive thing which gives us these flashes of insight which finally help us to find a solution and allows us to go forward. So I think programming would not be possible without system one, without the gut. Now I have absolutely no evidence to support that statement. But my gut tells me it's true, so I believe it. Um, oh, and programming is all about trade-offs, right? There's rarely the absolutely correct way to do something there are always trade-offs. And we tend to make most of our trade-offs with our gut, which is a problem because it doesn't understand arithmetic. It confuses, confuses a lot of things. For example, it thinks most has more weight than all. Um, it thinks not very much is the same as nothing. Um, it's really bad at math. But we use our gut in, in doing trade-offs, and that very often gets us into trouble. So I'm going to be giving you some examples of programming style in JavaScript. The, the theory that I'm going to give you works in all languages, but JavaScript is particularly good for these sorts of examples uh, because it has some of the best parts ever in a language and most of the worst parts ever put into a programming language. JavaScript has by far more bad parts than any other popular language. Um, so adopting a programming style which helps to mitigate that badness is really important. Um, and because there's so much badness in the language and all the traps that that badness sets for me, I don't trust myself to program in the language without good tool support. So I wrote something called JSLint, which is written in JavaScript, which reads my JavaScript programs and tells me when I'm using the bad parts so that I can know, okay, that's bad stuff. I don't want to be doing that. Because um, it's really easy to stray into the sharp edges in this language. There, there are traps all over the place. And it's free and it's available to everybody. Um, and it comes with this warning. It says, warning, JS Lint will hurt your feelings. And it's true. Um, I've, I've had my feelings hurt by it and I wrote it. Um, and I hear from people all the time whining, JS Lint hurt my feelings. You know, can you fix it, make it stop, you know, recognize my special needs that I have to write crappy code this way. So can you be more forgiving? Um, and so I, I've been hearing this whining for years and years. And at some point I started wondering, 
why is this? Why, why are people whining? Because what this is, it's a code quality tool. You don't have to use it, but if you decide you want to use it, it's because you want it to inform you about ways to make your program better, stronger, more resilient. And when it offers you that good advice, you go, well, I don't want to do that. You know, and, and they start crying. You go, wait a minute, there's no crying in programming. Why are people getting so upset? Why are they getting so emotional? You know, programmers can argue endlessly about stuff, which appears to be of no consequence, but from the intensity of their arguments, appears to be really important. You know, for example, do you put curly braces on the left or on the right? Now, when Ken Thompson designed the B language, when Dennis Ritchie added uh, Pascal types to it to, to create the C language, they were putting the curly braces on the right just because it seemed to make sense. It turns out there's not a good reason for why you should do it one way or the other. It's sort of like driving. Should we drive on the left side of the road or the right? There's not a good argument. You know, People in England drive as well as people in Europe. Uh, there's no evidence to suggest that one is safer or more efficient than the other. It's just a convention. Um, so. You know, you can't say if you should be on the left or right, but there's a really good reason for why we should all be on the same side. And we're lucky there's not a bridge from London to the rest of the world, because that would get confusing, but we don't. So, you know, we got compartmentalization there. Um, now, there were other people in Thompson's lab at, at, at Bell Labs who said, we want to put them on the left. And I'm sure they had a meeting about it. And after a while, Thompson said, hell with this, I don't care, this is a stupid argument, there's not a good reason one way or the other, do what you want, just don't invite me to any more meetings, just leave me out of this. Um, and it's a shame, because Thompson could have said, you know, could have had the compiler say, it's got to be on the right, damn it, and otherwise it's a syntax error. Because he didn't do that, who knows how many man centuries we've wasted arguing about, should it be on the left or on the right? And we get really upset. So if someone who's used to putting them on the left, goes to work for a shop that puts them on the right, and they say, okay, now that you're working here, you gotta put them on the right. He's gonna go, no, I don't wanna put them on the right, that's so wrong, can't you see how wrong that is? And system two will start rationalizing, because system one is saying, this is wrong, damn it. So system two is going, yeah, that, that's right, it is wrong, why is it wrong? And it starts making up all these things, and none of them make any sense, because there's not a good reason to prefer one or the other, it's just a convention, it's punctuation, it's just punctuation. Um, you know, why are we getting so upset about punctuation? So ultimately, where should we put them? I don't know. I and mean, there's not a good answer to that question, except it turns out in JavaScript, where there is. It turns out in JavaScript, you want to always put them on the right and never on the left. And this is why. Um, um, one of the things we do commonly in JavaScript is return an object literal, which produces a new object. This is a common pattern, we do this a lot. And if you put the curly brace on the right, it always does the right thing. And if you put the curly brace on the left, it returns undefined instead of your object. And it doesn't produce, in this case, any other warning. There's no syntax, uh, syntax error, there's no runtime error. It's just at some point, your program's gonna notice, we expected a function to be here, and we get the undefined value instead. Um, and that could be a, a large distance away from where this error actually happened. And so then you have to start debugging and walk it back. And you might actually bring it back to this statement and go, well, oh, I don't get it. It's there. You know, you can look at that code for an hour and not understand where the object disappeared. Um, this is because of a horrible design error in JavaScript called automatic semicolon insertion. Um, it was a well-intentioned feature, but it's a terrible feature. It's one of the very bad parts of the language. And in this case, it causes this problem. So um, if you always put your curly braces on the right, you will never experience this. And if you put your curly braces on the left, the day will come when you're going to endure this pain. Um, so you look at it in terms of a trade-off, okay? Uh, what's the difference in cost of putting the curly braces on the left or right? None, there is no cost. Uh, what's the benefit? We can avoid a terrible time-consuming headache. That's a good trade-off. For nothing, I get a little bit of immunity from, from a particularly nasty bug. That, that's a good trade-off. So we should prefer forms that are error-resistant because we're trying to be perfect, and so we want to avoid errors wherever we can. 
So another thing that Thompson came up with was the switch statement. He, he took Hoare's case statement and filtered it through the Fortran computed go-to. Now, Dijkstra said that uh, go-to was harmful and he was right. And it took us a generation to get rid of go-to, but it still exists in all modern languages in the form of the switch statement. So um, there's a, a hazard where you can have one case fall through into the next case. And one day, um, someone wrote to me and said, J.S. Lynch should check for this because it's a subtle error and it's difficult to see from reading the text, but it can really uh, cause problems. And <clears throat> I thought about it really carefully and I wrote back to him, um, I, I can understand how that could happen, but there is this elegance that happens when you can line up all the cases and get them to cascade one into another. That elegance is really highly desirable and the error could happen, but it hardly ever happens. And so looking at it in terms of trade-offs, you've got elegance versus hardly ever happens. I think this is actually a good feature of the language and I'm not going to report on it. Next day, the same guy wrote to me and said, I found a bug in JS Lint. Good, okay, so I threw it in the debugger. You know what happened? I had a case that was falling through. And in that moment, I achieved enlightenment. Because it turns out we spend an enormous amount of time tracking down errors. Um, we like to think we spend most of our time power typing, but that's not where the time goes. The time goes in correcting our mistakes. And it's painful and, and time consuming, and we tend to black it out. Once, once we found it, we get this little rush of euphoria and go, ha, ah, good, back to power typing. Um, but in this particular instance, it was so humiliating because I had just given this speech about how this was a good feature, and boom, it, I can't ignore the evidence, in fact, that this is a bad feature. So I was forced in this one instance to learn from my mistakes, which is rare. It's something I'd like to do more of, but generally we don't do it very often. Um, so I adopted a new strategy with respect to switch statements that I never intentionally fall through which means I can now find the cases where I accidentally fall through. Um, it's hard to find the accidental cases when you've got the intentional cases. Um, yeah, so, um, so what was my error? I, I said that hardly ever happens, which means the same thing is it happens. Um, that's the gut talking. The gut is really bad at math, and I was depending on the gut in, in doing this evaluation. Um, also, I was wrong in the, the elegance argument. It turns out, what is the cash value of that, arg of that elegance? It turns out there isn't any, and, and perhaps there is even a negative value, because it can often cause you to do uh, coupling and weird code convolution in order to achieve this cascade, which in fact has no value. So you can actually make the code cruftier. Um, so it turns out not to be worth it. Um, so don't fall through. So a good style can help produce better programs. Style should not be about personal preference or self-expression. It should be about driving down your error rate because ultimately that's the thing that's important. Um, and we can learn something about programming style from literary style. Um, the Romans wrote Latin all in uppercase with no word breaks or punctuation. And this worked for them. They were able to, to produce great literature. Um, to our modern eyes, this is hard to read. Um, and, and there were ambiguities which could make things difficult. For example, the third line could be read as now or DB reeks. Now, we, we know it doesn't mean that, but it could. Um, but this worked well. I mean, they were the greatest empire in the world for a while. Um, but when Constantine adopted Christianity as the state religion of the Roman Empire, it became necessary to take the scriptures and copy them and send them all over the world. And this presented a problem because they did not have originals of any of the documents. All they had were copies of copies of copies, and none of the copies agreed. Every copy was different um, because it turns out um, this is an, uh, an error-inducing format. Um, medieval copyists introduced lowercase word breaks and punctuation, and these innovations helped to reduce the error rate. It made it easier for them to copy the manuscripts and distribute them. They also had the unexpected benefit of making the manuscripts easier to read and interpret. And that turned out to be useful too. So when Gutenberg started printing, he copied these conventions. And we're still using these conventions today. 
the conventions we have of, of capitalizing the beginning of a sentence and putting a period at the end of it, all of that, we've been doing that for hundreds and hundreds of years, and it works. We've all gone, we've all been schooled in this stuff. Um, it all looks right to us. You know, so a sloppy reader might say, well, it doesn't matter if I put the periods in the right place because the reader can figure it out. But we know you don't want to be doing that because it makes you look illiterate and it distracts the reader from the message. You want them to be focusing on your on your writing and not on your punctuation. You know, so you, you never see um, a great author saying, I'm such a great stylist, I'm going to put all my periods at the beginning of the sentences and not the end. And you, you just don't see that because it would, it would look stupid. Um, so um, good style can help reduce the occurrence of errors. It works in literature. It's going to work in programming, too. Um, there are lots of good style uh, books around. One of the, the best ones is The Elements of Style, written by um, William Strunk. It was self-published about 100 years ago. English has evolved some since then. So some of his advice is a little dated, but a lot of it is still really good. It's all about good composition and good use of language. And a number of writers have adapted the elements of style to programming languages. And it's, it's a very good mapping. Um, so programs must communicate clearly to people. There's a school of thought that says it only matters that the compiler understand it. But that's wrong, especially as we're getting more agile, as we're doing more team development. It's necessary for everybody to understand the program. So clarity is essential. Um, so we should be using the elements of good style wherever possible. And in fact, most of, or a lot of the conventions of literature map very nicely onto programming languages. Um, so, you know, we have conventions where we put a space after a comma and not before. Um, and, and this, you know, in literature, that doesn't impede a, a writer because a, a good writer will slavishly conform to the elements of style and express his creativity in his words, in his structures, in his in his images, um, you know, so you don't need to be messing with punctuation in order to prove that you're creative. Um, programming languages require more precision than literature does, um, so we can have conventions to help uh, disambiguate things, like um, we use parents to do uh, grouping and statement structures, and we also use it for invoking functions. So we can use uh, strategically spaced, placed spaces in order to help disambiguate those. Um, one of the good parts in JavaScript is its functions. Uh, they're, they're brilliant. Um, but it didn't get everything right. So one of the things that's useful is the immediately invoked function expression, where we create a function and then immediately execute it. Uh, that gives us um, a closure um, and a scope, which helps us to uh, contain and, and bind variables, which is a really useful thing. But unfortunately, in statement position, this form turns out to be a syntax error because of a design flaw. So uh, people figured out that you could overcome this flaw by wrapping the function in parentheses. And now it's not in statement position anymore, and it does the correct thing. Um, but I think this is missing something, because I want to do more than just trick the compiler into accepting this. I want to make it clear to the reader What's going on here? Um, and this use of parentheses doesn't communicate that. Um, and in fact, we've got the invoking parents hanging off there, you know, like a pair of dog balls, just you know, like they're not part of this expression. So, uh, ladies might want to look away. Um, so I, I think this whole thing is cleaner if we put the invoking parentheses around um, the whole thing. So the outer parentheses say, Reader, what's important here is this whole expression, that we are taking this function and invoking it. Look at the, consider this whole thing as a unit, because that is what's important. Don't think of just the function. I don't want them to maybe miss the invoking parentheses. I want the whole thing to be together. Um, so I told you about automatic semicolon insertion being one of the bad parts of JavaScript. This is one of the places, another place where uh, it hurts you. So if you have a, an assignment statement, followed by one of these parenthesized uh, function expressions, um, you would hope that it would insert a semicolon there, but it doesn't. Um, so it will instead treat y as a function, passing the result of the other function as its argument. 
which is wrong, but you get no syntax warning here because this is considered to be a correct statement, even though it's obviously wrong. Um, so th the lesson here is do not depend on JavaScript semicolon insertion. Again, it was a well-intentioned feature, but it is stupid in the way it was designed. Um, and you know, so if, if you look at the ECMAScript standard, which describes how this works, it gives you, it shows you this case. You know, it says, oh, by the way, it fails in cases like this. Um, so just because it's in the language doesn't mean it's a good part. It's a very bad part and should be avoided. JavaScript has a with statement that was modeled after Pascal's with statement. Um, and this is another bad part. So here we're saying uh, with O foo equals coda, and it can expand into one of these four statements. Um, I don't know if anyone here knows JavaScript, or if you could guess which of those four statements it will expand into. Anybody? It's a trick question. It could expand into any of them. There's no way you can tell from reading this code which one it's going to do. And in fact, every time the statement executes, it could do a different one. So since we're trying to be perfect, we can't have any confidence in a program that we cannot even read and, and know what it does. Um, so my advice is never use the with statement. It's got this ambiguity in it, uh, which makes it um, extremely unreliable. It also is terrible for performance. Um, but ignoring the performance problems, it's just unreliable. Now, there are a lot of clever people who have found uses for with, and they suggest that um, you should be able to use it in limited uh, places in the cases where it actually does something useful. Um, but I'm not saying that it isn't useful. I'm saying that there's never a case where it isn't confusing. And confusion is the enemy. When a program appears to be doing one thing and does something else, that's when errors happen. So confusion must be avoided. Um, and in this case, it's easy to avoid if you simply don't use that statement and write the thing that it expands into instead um, there's no confusion. It's very clear what the program is doing. Uh, JavaScript's equality operator does type coercion before it does its equality operation. So as a consequence, um, you get a lot of false positives. And you also lose transitivity, which is something you would like to have in an equality operator. Now, fortunately, JavaScript has a triple equal operator, which does the right thing in all of these cases. Um, it, it only does the wrong thing in the case of man. Um, so uh, my advice is always use triple equal, never use double equal, um, because you avoid this confusion. Now, there are people who have found the, you know, the rare case where double equal actually does exactly what they want. Um, so they ask, well, can I use double equal in that case? And my advice is no. Because the reader of your program doesn't know that you found the one case where double equal does the right thing. You know, it, it's more likely that you just made a mistake. So you want your programs to be clearly not mistakes. If there's a feature of the language that is sometimes problematic, and if it can be replaced by another feature that is more reliable, then always use the more reliable feature. Um, this is a relatively new feature in JavaScript, but it's been in other languages for a while, multi-line string literal. I don't like this for a couple of reasons. I think it was a mistake to put it into JavaScript. Uh, first off is it breaks indentation because the continuation has to go all the way out to the margin. And we do a lot of nesting in our programs. You know, we've got functions within functions and objects within objects, and having things go out to the margin breaks indentation and actually makes the programs more difficult to comprehend. But worse than that, we've got this syntactic hazard. So here we've got two statements. One is correct. The other is a syntax error. Can anybody spot the syntax error in the second line? Anybody? There's a space right here. Now, it's obvious once it's pointed out, right? Um, but I want my programs to be obviously correct. So I don't want to be using forms that are difficult to distinguish from common errors. Um, so I just don't use this form. I've got, there are at least two other ways in the language to, to create long strings. Um, I'll use those instead. And in the next edition, we're going to get um, backtick strings, which will work properly. So there's no reason to use this feature. 
avoid forms that are difficult to distinguish from the common errors. Um, this is something that was wrong in C and in JavaScript. Uh, Java got this one right. So the first line looks like it does what the third line does, but it actually does what the second line does. So when you get a program that looks like that, you have to ask, okay, what's going on here? Um, is this an error or not? The only thing you're sure of is that the programmer was incompetent. Beyond that, you really don't know. So my advice is figure out which one of these you mean and always write that instead. Um, don't be writing um, things that look like errors. Make your programs look like what they do. Scope is one of the best inventions in the history of programming languages. We first got it in Algol 60 and it's found its way into virtually all languages since then. Most languages have block scope means you know between any within any block within curly braces any variables defined in there are visible only within that block JavaScript doesn't do that JavaScript has function scope which means any variable declared in a function is only visible within the function um, but um, and it turns out that's enough you can write good programs just having function scope the problem here is that um, JavaScript syntax looks exactly the same as languages that have block scope. And so for programmers coming to JavaScript from other languages, they assume that the conventions they use for block scope are what they should do. And in fact, those conventions can fail in JavaScript because it doesn't respect block scope. It only has function scope. Um, so um, you know, there are conventions in, uh, a in a block scope language that say you should declare the variable in the uh, in the block which contains all uses of it at the site of first use, if possible. And that's really good advice in such a language. But if you don't have block scope, then the best advice is declare all of your variables at the top of the function because that's actually what happens. Um, JavaScript does this weird thing called hoisting, where it splits a var statement into two pieces and the declaration part gets moved out of whatever block it was in to the top of the function. And if it turns out you had a couple of blocks that were declaring the same variable name, um, both of those var definitions get moved to the top and unified. So what looked like two variables is actually one. Um, and that is a real source of confusion that can cause real errors. So as a result of that in JavaScript, um, you need to declare all of your variables at the top of the function. And uh, functions, uh, function statements do a similar kind of hoisting thing, um, which has its own set of confusions. So I recommend to clear all of your functions at, um, before you call them as well. I find this is the most controversial thing in JavaScript. Um, um, here we have a four var statement. And the variable i, the induction variable, is not scoped to the loop. It's scoped to the function. Um, so properly, you should move that var i to the top because that, in fact, is what's happened. But people, especially if they've come from Java or C or C++, you know, this is how you do it. This is how you, if you're writing in Java, you put it there. And I say, write in the language you're writing in. Uh, that turns out to be the wrong way to do it in JavaScript. Um, it will get you into trouble. Um, the next edition of JavaScript will probably have a let statement, which will work just like the var statement, except it will respect block scope. So when that happy day comes and we have let, my advice will change to never use the var statement, always use the let statement, unless you have to run on IE6 or IE7 or IE8 or IE9 or IE10. We don't know what's in IE11 yet, but if you only have to run on IE12 and above, then yeah, you'll want to use the let statement. Um, global variables are evil in all languages. Um, JavaScript requires the use of global variables because it doesn't have a linker. So all uh, the way compilation units communicate is they're all dumped into a common global variable space uh, where they can collide with each other. Uh, this turns out to be the root cause of the cross-site scripting attack. Um, you know, the security problems of the browser uh, come from this. This was a design error, um, and we're trying to fix it. Um, but because we have function scope, it's possible to mitigate this problem. Um, so there are programming conventions we can use to minimize 
our use of global variables. Um, so for the few global variables that you actually do use, I advise use all uppercase because I want them to stand out because this thing is dangerous and weird and you need to respect it. And so I, I want its name to, to make it clear that that's what's going on. Now in other languages, all uppercase means different things. For example, in C, it, it can mean a macro. Um, and, that because, and that was for a good reason. There was a confusion in C as something a variable or a macro. Um, that was a confusion and sometimes it bothered people. So they came up with the uppercase convention. Since then, that convention has been copied into other languages which didn't even have macros in them and had no confusion there at all. Um, and so that style says, well, you should use uppercase for constants. But there's no reason for that convention. Um, I think, uh, at, at least in JavaScript, um, it makes more sense to use it for global variables. JavaScript has a new prefix, which was modeled after Java's uh, new prefix, uh, but it doesn't work right. It, it's weird. It was intended to simulate uh, uh, classical construction, but it does something very, very different. Um, and it turns out in JavaScript, if you forget to use the new prefix, instead of getting a syntax error or a runtime warning, instead it will just go and start clobbering global variables which is a terrible thing. Unfortunately, this got fixed in ES5 strict, um, but in older versions of the language, or if you're still in the sloppy mode, um, you need to watch out for this. So we have a convention that all constructor functions should be written with an initial capital letter, and nothing else should ever be written with an initial capital letter. Um, that's the only convention we have to help us determine when new is missing. Um, this is an ambiguous case that's unique to JavaScript. Uh, the first statement looks like it does uh, what the second statement does, but actually does what the third statement does. So this is another case where the only thing you know for sure is that the programmer is incompetent. He thinks he's defining um, two local variables, but he's actually creating a global variable and a local variable, which is quite bad. So write in a way that clearly communicates your intent. Okay, this one's going to be a little controversial, and I'll remind you that controversial does not mean wrong. Okay, so um, this operator was designed by Ken Thompson in V and was copied into C. Uh, it was an originally intended for incrementing pointer variables. Uh, now, since then, we have determined that pointer arithmetic is harmful, and so we don't do it anymore. The last popular programming language to feature pointer arithmetic was C++ a language so bad it was named after this operator. Um, this operator was implicated in the buffer overrun craze of the 90s because it's really easy to write dense code using this which tries to do too much which is very difficult to understand and which can very easily run off the end of memory and allow an attacker to take over your system. Um, I, I find in my own practice that when I'm using this operator anywhere, I get this twitch, and I, I got to start optimizing. I got to try to push stuff in, all into one line, and I can't control it. So finally, I had to say, I'm done. I don't use plus plus anymore. I don't trust myself to use it because I can't control this. Because optimizing stuff into one line has no value. You know, so it's a waste of time to even try. Um, and it, it can introduce bugs and, and security hazards and I can't stop myself. So the only way I was able to control my behavior was to say I'm not using it anymore. I'm using plus equal one instead. And then I'm calm. I can just add one and I'm good. Um, and I hear complaints all the time from people saying, oh, wait a minute. You know, I should be able to write x plus plus because it means exactly the same thing and it's one character shorter. That means when I'm power typing, I can just go and it, you know, and I'm so much more productive. And I, and I have to say, well, first off, typing is not where we spend our time. Um, um, and second off, they're not equivalent, okay? Uh, plus plus x is equivalent. So when I see somebody making this mistake, you know, in the increment part of the for statement, if I see x plus plus, I have to go, okay, this clown, does he know the difference between pre-increment and post-increment? And so I have to look at every plus plus in this program. You know, did he get this one right? get this one right. It's because this is a really subtle off by one error because it's only off by one for a tiny amount of time. And so tracking that down and debugging it is really hard. Um, and so 
I think it's better just to avoid it entirely. Recently, I was reviewing some code and I saw this, plus plus x plus plus x. Okay, what's the story here? What, what's going on? I'm guessing uh, somebody wrote plus plus x and then later someone else came and noticed there's an off by one error, so they put it put in another one. Now, if the, if the first one had been written x plus equal one, it would have been really easy to change it to x plus equal two, and it would have been right. And that raises a question, why do we have a completely different syntactic form for adding one than any other value. How, what's the benefit of that? I, I really don't see a benefit, but I do see people get really emotional. You can't take my plus plus away. Uh, how am I gonna add one to things? And you go, just one, you know. It, people get really, really upset about plus plus. So for no cost, by adopting a more rigorous style, many classes of errors can be automatically avoided. Here's another one. This is another of uh, Thompson's fault. By the way, Ken Thompson, I think, is one of the smartest programmers to ever live. Um, but I think he made some stylistic mistakes in, in D. And these mistakes have been copied into every other language since then. So um, B was based on BCPL, which was a, a marvelous little language. Um, Thompson's major contribution to the syntax of D was to take BCPL and make it look more like Fortran. So um, uh, BCPL required the curly braces, and the parents around the condition were optional. And Thompson did it the other way, because that's how it was in Fortran. And that was a mistake. Um, because, you know, it looks like it means that, but it actually means that. C is going to be executed unconditionally. And this is a, another common source of errors, that the program appears to be doing something, um, but does something else. So my advice is always put the curly braces in. Every time, even if you're only gonna do one thing, put the curly braces in because it makes your program more resilient and it's much less likely that the next person to modify your code is going to be tricked by your austerity and, and introduce errors. And I go, oh, but you, know, you, have, but you have to type, you go, <laughs> so hard. You know, and, it's not, it's really easy. You just go thump, thump, and boom. You know, and there's this new thing now called keyboard macros where you can just have them put in for you automatically. Highly recommend, always put the curly braces in. It costs next to nothing, uh, um, and it, it helps reduce your error rate. That's what it's all about. As our processes become more agile, our coding must be more resilient. Um, so I, I see a lot of people being intentional bad stylists. Um, some of it's a lot of it's due to undereducation. It turns out most of the people who are writing in JavaScript should not be writing in any language. Um, <laughs> um, but they do because it's the most popular language in the world and, and so they're doing it. And, and they can get away with it, but often they don't understand where the stuff's supposed to go and so they just leave it out. Um, we see uh, some old school guys who, um, you know, they're coming at the language from Java. You know, you know, I'd rather be using Java, but you know, okay, I'm writing in in JavaScript, but there's no way I'm going to know what I'm doing. You know, on principle, and um, and so they'll they'll adopt conventions that don't fit the language. Then there are thrill seekers, uh, people who will intentionally write code which is confusing or error prone, just to show off their mad skills. Um, and they think, you know, I'm so good at this stuff, I can write crazy stuff and it doesn't go bad, uh, ignoring the cases where it does go bad. And then there are exhibitionists who um, will study the language and find the weird edge cases and places where the language does stuff you would never expect. They go, wow, what an amazing discovery. How can I use that? And they'll start designing programs specifically to show off these weird features, programs that nobody's going to understand. Um, you know, it, it's just childish, but we see a lot of that, especially in the JavaScript community. And they'll be saying, that's intentional. You know, I, I, I meant to do that. Um, I know what I'm doing. And I say, no, if you knew what you were doing, you would not be doing that. So programming is the most complicated thing that humans do. And programs must be perfect, and people are not good at perfect. 
um, myself, I'm a deeply flawed human being, but somehow I make a living as a programmer. And it's hard. Um, programming just um, demands discipline, and a programming style demands discipline. It's not selecting features because they're pretty or familiar or popular. It's because they help drive down your error rate. Um, so when deciding what should go into a style, that should be the number one criteria above all else. Saving keystrokes should not be a consideration. Um, now, the alternative is the abyss, right? You know, we spend a lot of time, you know, in the abyss. Uh, Nietzsche said, when you gaze into the abyss, the abyss gazes into you. It's terrible. It's cold. It's soul-destroying. Um, and normal people can't do it. Uh, the normal person has to debug a program, and they spend any time in the abyss. They say, I'm changing majors. I don't know what's wrong with you people. I can't do this. It turns out there's something seriously wrong with us, that um, we are able to, or we have two things going on. One is we've got this incredible optimism that we can go into the abyss and we will come back out. Normal people can't do that. But because we have that optimism, it means we can't do scheduling work crap uh, because we just have no idea where we're spending our time or, or how long things take. Um, but the other is we get selective amnesia. We are not aware of how much time we spend down there. Uh, we black it out. And, and all we remember, you know, what did I do today? Oh, I was power typing. I was writing program. Um, you know, so if we want to be more productive, the best thing we can do is figure out a way to spend less time in the abyss. And, and that's what I'm advocating. So the JS Lint style was driven by the need to automatically detect defects. Um, I spent a lot of time on comp.lang.javascript. And there was a constant flood of people coming in uh, to the conference um, saying, my program doesn't work, and someone spot the, the problem. And so I'd, I'd cut it out and put it into JSLint. And sometimes JSLint would immediately find what was wrong. And sometimes it couldn't. And I go, OK, so what do I need to do in order to, to solve that? And it turned out in some cases, they were using forms which were undecidable. That there was no way I could statically determine what the defect was. Um, and ultimately, reluctantly, I, I had to decide that those forms themselves were defects. That um, if I could persuade people not to write using those forms, then I could do a much better job of finding the errors where they really occur. Um, so uh, the approach I finally settled on was language subset, which was not something that I ever expected. You know, it's been said only a madman would use all of C++. It's also been said only a madman would use C++, but that's, that's for another conference. But you know the subsetting idea applies to all languages. It turns out every language has features which probably shouldn't be there. That um, every language designer is trying to push the state of the art, and he'll be adopting features from other languages and come up with a few inventions of his own. And very often they get it all right, but invariably there's at least one place where they they went too far. And once a language gets out there and people start using it. They can't take it back. The language designer is powerless to, to remove design mistakes from the language. It turns out you have that power. You can decide yourself that that is a bad part, and I will avoid the consequences of that badness by simply not using that feature. That's a power you have that the language designer does not have. I strongly recommend you exercise that power. So, there will be bugs. I'm not promising that you're going to be bug-free by adopting a more rigorous programming style. What I am saying is that you can move the odds in your favor. And anything you can do to help reduce the amount of time in the abyss, that turns out to be a great trade-off. So good style is good for your gut. That's the end. Thank you, and good night.